Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Death Side Talks with Mark. Today, I am just going to talk about what's going on here at the Thoughtful Gamer. I feel like I'm still recovering a bit from PAX Unplugged in trying to get games played and in trying to catch up on sleep and get back into a decent sleep schedule. Usually I try in these podcasts to have some kind of theme, but I couldn't think of any particular theme unless I was going to be writing about Gloom or talking about Gloomhaven again for 20 minutes. But if you want to hear my thoughts on Gloomhaven, just read the first impression I posted just the other day. But I don't want want to talk about Gloomhaven the whole time. So let's just talk about what's going on here. Uh, The first thing, if you're part of the Patreon or part of any Patreon, you probably got an email the other day about their new, the new way they're going to be doing the charges where essentially they're shifting the fees from the producers of the content to the supporters. I've seen a lot, basically on Twitter at least, it seems universally uh, people who are on Patreon do not like it. But I think it's an interesting study in how these kinds of things work within decision making of a company. One of the things when I was at my last job we talked about was when we're making big changes is looking at it from the other, from like a backwards perspective in time. So in other words, if this was the policy from the beginning, would people have not liked it or are they only disliking it because it is a change? I think it would have been perfectly fine the other way. So in that sense, I don't care that much about the changes. It's obviously more money for me, and I don't think any of my supporters are going to drop out because of it, but I also don't have that many supporters. The interesting thing is that while the arguments against the changes are valid, speaking out against it actually makes the situation worse because from the pure pure profit-making perspective of someone who's on Patreon, You obviously don't want people to drop out, but I think for the most part, if this was just a single email from Patreon and then they kind of quietly made the changes, people who were donating money to to people on Patreon probably wouldn't make on the whole that many moves. But now that it's a big deal, I think more people will pull out their their funding from different places. The, The best argument I've heard against it is that it harms people who are giving many small donations because there's a there's a 35 cent fee on each one in addition to a percentage so if you're only giving a dollar to you know 20 different people each month that's going to go up by like 40 percent that's a fairly convincing argument that that this change isn't isn't particularly good for uh, patreon as a whole but i'm Really curious to see what the site-wide stats are, you know, in the in the coming months. I hope they release that because I think it's a really interesting case study for making changes like this. And while I'm certainly sympathetic to the arguments against it, from my perspective, I'm not going to be able to influence Patreon. I'm not a big enough person on there, and it's going to be very difficult to see how this affects me. Because if there is an effect, it's probably on things I won't be able to detect. For instance, someone will not support in whereas otherwise they would have so i can't track that but we'll, we'll see what happens because of it and i'm not going to worry too much about it or rant about it on twitter but it did happen and uh hopefully it doesn't harm my my intake of funding for this project uh, i am st- still playing gloomhaven we're playing it pretty much every chance we get advancing my character he's leveled up a couple of times i'm a psychic rat man which has been fun although i'm noticing that i'm definitely shifting more into a support role with my character which is interesting because i don't usually play support roles in these kinds of games but my damage output is certainly less than a couple of the other people in the party so i'm working more on flexible builds and support builds you know stunning immobilizing I've got a cool card that lets me give movement points to someone else or give them a super attack, things like that. The The branching on this particular class seems to be either focusing on that kind of support build or on summoning things. I'm shifting away from the summoning only because 
the first creature you could summon had only one move, which was very slow. So it was mostly useless the one time, or it was entirely useless the one time I tried it. And it would only work pretty well on some maps, although I've looked ahead and some of the extra cards I'll get at much higher levels can summon some pretty powerful creatures. But I think I'm going to go away from that and more towards this flexible support role. Beyond that, like, we're having a great time with it. We're having lots of fun with Gloomhaven. I pretty much said everything I wanted to in the review, although I do want to emphasize the graphic design on those scenarios can be very annoying particularly with doors it's they list literally everything you put on the map in like a key and an itinerary there so you can pull things out and organize what you need for that particular scenario except doors and then there are like two different door visuals there's one that looks like an actual door and the other one looks like some kind of mist which i if in one scenario we screwed up because i didn't realize they were supposed to be doors it's it's a it's a very annoying oversight there and that's probably my biggest complaint with Gloomhaven. Otherwise, it's so much fun. It's really, really fun. We barely squeezed through a win last night in a uh, bonus side scenario, which I'm glad we were able to pull off, but it was it was a rush. I, I lost a lot of my movement points because I misplayed the early game and lost a lot of movement cards trying to vo avoid damage, and everyone else pretty much had to win it, and I just kind of stuck back and sniped people. Other than Gloomhaven, we got some games that I haven't been able to play yet. I've got a couple of small deduction games that I got review copies of that I'm trying to get out before reviews of before Christmas. And it's, it's a strange thing because there are a lot of these small card deduction games or social deduction games or just small card games in general. Like I saw so many of them at PAX Unplugged. And the problem with the social deduction genre is that... It has its classic already with resistance, and you can't really simplify the formula more than the resistance. Like, it took that type of game, and it made it as elegant as possible. Essentially. I can't think of any way to do it more elegantly. There's win-lose banana, which I guess is kind of the ultimate simplification, but, you know, with keeping some aspect of game to it, the resistance just did that so well. So the problem becomes that any other game that wants to do social deduction has to make it more convoluted. It has to add bits to the resistance formula, you know, in an either literal way like Secret Hitler did, or in a kind of more generic way that just has to add more game to it. And that's hard to do well. The one we played what seemed all right we were playing at the lowest player count. It's four to eight players. We played it with four, and it did not seem particularly balanced at four. It was quite easy for people to deduce who the spy was, although there's an additional game on top of that after that person's identity is revealed in this particular version. I need to play it with more people to see if there's the makings of a decent game or if it's just kind of boring. I'm thinking it'll get better with more people, but that's the one... I'm I'm working on right now in reviewing. But the, again, the problem is I just like well, I'd rather play the resistance here. I I would never try to make a social deduction game. I think it's probably of any genre to make a game in that's the hardest. When you have like Gloomhaven that comes along and takes the dungeon crawler game and just makes it the best one, at least that I've played or I've heard of, that opens up lots of possibilities because there's lots of different design decisions that Gloomhaven did that someone could run along with and, and do more of, or they can alter a few things. And there's so much design potential now that this is kind of the ground floor for that genre. But that's on a big game with lots of different moving parts. In a social deduction game, you don't have that much opportunity. I think the resistance takes away design choices for the future because it does what it does so well. The one that I've heard might do it best as an alternative to Resistance is Deception, Murder, in Hong Kong. I'll be interested in playing that if I get the opportunity, but I'll probably in the future refuse any more social deduction games unless they look really interesting in terms of review copies because I just don't see how they can improve that much on what we have right now, which is which is disappointing because I do enjoy the genre, but it, it's so hard because you're you're working with so little design space and you have to activate kind of the players imaginations and the players are really the ones making the game 
So more additions can take away from that because they're thinking of gaming it rather than just simply trying to do social deduction. Anyway, there'll be a review of a new social deduction game coming out in the next couple of weeks. I also got to play in my quest to play at least the significant games in the top 100. I played Castles of Mad King Ludwig and Terraforming Mars over the past couple of weeks, and they're both very, very good. I think I like Terraforming Mars the best. I, I kept hearing, you know, it's I think it was the last game in the top 10, the current top 10 that I hadn't played, and I kept hearing that it was probably one of the more overrated ones, but I think it's really fun, at least in the first play. It's got some interesting things going around. Well, it's a tableau builder, which I enjoy. I love tableau builders, and it does a semi-cooperative thing decently because there's a main board that everyone can build on and everyone is working together to essentially to terraform Mars, to raise the temperature to a certain degree and raise the oxygen levels and place down oceans. And when all three of those things max out, that's when the game ends. So there's a mutual endpoint that's set by the players collectively, but everyone's trying to do it better by playing cards and building their tableaus and getting points for various things. So it has that just fun nature of trying to combo different things together and build a really efficient tableau, but it also has the map, which provides a little bit more direct competition over certain spots and helps you combo things out a bit more. One of the other cool things is that it has end-of-game awards, so you get points for having the most of something, but there are three of them, or excuse me, there are five of them available, and the players activate three of them for increasing costs. So if you think you're going to be getting a specific award, and what I did that helped me quite a bit is I nominated that award to be one of the final three awards early in the game, so I got it for cheaper. It did hurt me in my momentum in terms of playing cards, but it pretty much guaranteed I was getting that portion of points at the end of the game. It was just a solid game. The cards were interesting. They were all different. There were clear different multiple strategies you could go for. We did apparently a drafting variant, which seems fine. It still seemed a little bit random in what cards you got, but I certainly want to play it again, and I would definitely consider buying it. Castles of Mad King Ludwig was about what I expected it to be, which is a take on suburbia. It's a little bit simpler than Suburbia, but more AP prone. The di the main difference is that instead of Suburbia, where you just have the, the title sliding down the market, in Mad King Ludwig, you have a person called a master builder who sets the prices for everything, which is interesting, but you could sit there thinking about that forever, and that could really drag the game down. There's otherwise the same kinds of things. There's trying to put tiles next to each other that work well together. One of the things in Ludwig is you're trying to complete rooms by filling, essentially covering all the entrances. So there's not an entrance to the outside and that'll activate some kind of ability on the card. So it was clever and it's already a really solid system. So I enjoyed it. I probably still like Suburbia a bit more because of the speed bump thing and how it creates a really fascinating kind of momentum curve with the engine building and trying to get points and such. Although I can see a bit more flexibility with, with Ludwig, whereas in Suburbia, they're, they're flexible strategies, but they kind of have to follow a similar pattern. Well, Suburbia is about trying to figure out when the end of the game is going to happen and trying to peak at that point. Ludwig was just about getting maximizing how many points you're getting each turn and what you're potentially setting up for. It also has a spatial element where you have to make sure your pieces fit and don't overlap each other because they're not hexagons like in Suburbia, which was interesting and actually hurt me at one point, but I still ended up winning the game just by trying to maximize points each turn. I wasn't trying to build an engine or anything or, or go for anything fancy. I just tried to get as many tiles that gave me points as possible and use them well and ended up killing it, so... Again, I would like to play the game. Since we own Suburbia as a game group, I don't know if I would consider buying Ludwig, but it's it was certainly very, very fun. We've gotten quite a few games here in the last few months from the Asthma Day sale, from review copies from PAX Unplugged. I've gotten a couple other contacts just through BGG uh, for review copies. And just the other day on Twitter... I was talking about how I'd never played a Hex Encounter War game, and the folks from Holland Spiel 
which is a small, independent, mostly war game publisher, was like, hey, that's fine, but we, we're doing a sale right now, and we have a lot of fun Hex Encounter games. So I was like, great, recommend one to me. And so they proceeded to create four large Twitter posts recommending about ten different games and explaining how they're all different. So I decided to grab one. I don't remember the name right now that they said was fairly unique and might be good a good entry point. And then I grabbed the game 4X, that's F-O-R-E-X, which is a zero randomness economic trading game. So that's right up my alley that I'd heard about before a few months ago and thought, wow, that looks interesting, but didn't know it was going to be uh, available at this point. So I grabbed that from them and I'd never played a Hollenspiel game. So it'll be interesting. I never played a Hex Encounter game. So... I'm excited to get those games. I don't know when I'm going to be able to get them played just because there are so many other games I need to get played to write reviews. I guess this is the, the standard game reviewer complaint. It's not really a complaint. It's it's awesome that people are, want to send review copies to me and without me even trying to contact them about it. So that means I'm getting my name out a bit. But I, I just want to keep playing Gloomhaven mostly. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'll get the, the games played. I'm not planning to buy... Well... Spirit Island just came back in stock, and I really want to play Spirit Island. So I also need to catch up on Netrunner cards, so I might make a cool stuff order with Netrunner cards and Spirit Island. And then I'll have that to play in, like, February or something. It's a it's a very first-world problem to have, and it's a very lame thing to complain about. But I guess I'm just mentioning it because it's exciting to me. The final thing I want to talk about is that the Thoughtful Gamer is in the running for some awards, the game blog the drinking meeples.com posted uh, i don't know if this is the first time they're doing it but i saw it on twitter and they said hey we're doing awards for the end of the year for people who do board game media and so i retweeted it and apparently i'm in the running for three awards at least but at this point which is Best new podcast, best new blog, and best blog overall. The nominations will close on the 10th, and then I believe from the 11th through the end of December, they will have voting on the on the people who got the most nominations. So if you like this podcast and you want to see it get some awards, head over to thedrinkingmeeples.com and you can nominate it there. Uh, so that's really exciting. I didn't think I would get enough nominations to appear on the list, but I figured I'd give it a shot, retweeted it, tweeted about it a bit, and apparently I'm in the running, so that's exciting. I think that's all I have. We're basically trying to play games and review them, and mostly, again, just Gloomhaven. It's so good. It, it's just comfortable. It feels right to have the characters, and the decisions are interesting in the dungeons, and I want to see what kind of story elements pop up. I want to see what happens when we retire a character. I want to see one of the new classes. Like, that. that's exciting. There are 11 classes we haven't even unlocked yet. There's so much in the box that we haven't even had the opportunity to look at, and all of it's been solid, solidly designed and incredibly fun. But there'll be more stuff coming up for the Thoughtful Gamer. Check us out at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to rate and review this on iTunes, and I'm on social media as well. And if you're interested in supporting us, we're still working towards the $80 a month goal so I can essentially break even for 2018. If you do want to support that, head over to the to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. With just a $2 a month support level, you'll be able to listen in on the main podcast live and banter with everyone else and taunt us and make jokes and laugh when we make mistakes. You'll also get on our awesome Discord server where we talk about games all the time and other random things. It's a great time. If you want to get access to that, just go to Patreon and, and chip in a couple bucks a month. Thanks for listening. We'll have a full podcast next time, I believe with my wife, although I need to confirm that she wants to do it still. If not, I will figure something else out. Till then, goodbye.